comments ikke? Sandra, I'm not going to see what's going on on Zoom. So if you can like monitor the chat, and just let me know what's going on. Um, that sounds great. Maybe I'll try logging in as well on another computer. start in a minute. First uh, lecture that many of you have had at U of T. How many people is this like the first lecture they've had at U of T? Yeah, it's going to be a weird one. I have never given a lecture like this before either with like half the class online, half here. And for the last 18 months I've been teaching online. So I no longer know what three-dimensional students look like. So uh, <laughs> this is, hopefully I will still have some abilities. We'll see. Uh, bear with me. Um, Anyway, welcome to U of T. Yeah, for those of you who are uh, at their first lecture, how many people are, are continuing grad school or continuing undergrad that were at U of T before? Okay, so uh, several people, but most people are coming from elsewhere. I guess for those of you who are continuing, is this your first class in person in the last 18 months or so? Has anybody actually been in a classroom with other human beings in the last 18 months? Okay, me neither. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> well, welcome back. It's a bit different for sure. Uh, with everybody wearing masks, um, but uh, it's good at least to be getting back more normal. Uh, obviously, tell me if you can't hear. I'm not used to lecturing with a mask. Uh, I think no one's been in this classroom for 18 months because there's no batteries in the wireless mic. So I'm just, yeah, if it's not loud enough, tell me, I'm just going to yell more and more, right? Well, we'll use Andrew as a repeater. He can, he can yell what I yelled, right? So Andrew's one of my PhD students, so he's used to interpreting my mumblings, right? That is uh, one of his great skills. So, okay, so without no further ado, let's, uh, let's start in. Those of you who filled out the, uh, the online kind of little questionnaire, thank you. I'm gonna the responses and I'll share them with you uh, briefly next class, but it gives me a good idea of like what the background of the class is um, and, uh, and what your interests are. I'd like to be interactive. Uh, just because it's a better way to teach. And I think probably all of you, and I certainly I have been starved for interaction for the last 18 months. So if you have a question, you know, ask, right? Uh, I'm going to ask you questions and uh, hopefully some of you will answer. Okay, so welcome to East 1756, Reconfigurable Computing and FPGA Architecture. And uh, let's see, I'm going to start off with just a bit, bit of like, what is the course? Carefully, if you already know this, so I'll go through it pretty quickly. So what are we going to talk about in this course? Basically two topics. How do you use FPGAs? So what are these devices? 
why do we why do they exist so before we talk about why, how can we use them we need to know why does this thing exist at all should we use them fpjs are different than most devices they're extremely flexible so we're going to talk about program so how do we how to use this chip that can is kind of a blank sheet of paper can be used to do anything uh, and optimization techniques um, and also strengths and weaknesses of fpgas versus other compute devices uh, everything's got you know it's not the right this is where it is a good choice kind of uh, a little less than halfway through the course we'll pivot a bit into okay how do we actually design these chips so you now know what they're good at what they're not so good at how to get the most out of them how do we actually make them better? So, some questions to that. They're composed uh, sub blocks, uh, logic blocks, RAM blocks, DSP blocks. So, we talk about how do we make those? And then they're connected together with programmable interconnect. That's what allows you to really, you can connect them in so many different ways. So, how do you make it efficient? It actually occupies most of the area and delay of the chip. And then after we've gone through some of the, everyone should know this, how to make a good FPGA, we'll go through some alternative architectures. Um, should we put registers in the routing? Should we have networks on chip embedded? Uh, various other techniques. Um, you can't completely talk about FPGAs without talking about the CAD tools. The chips are completely unusable without software automation. So a modern FPGA has perhaps 100 million switches to program. Nobody's going to do that by hand. So we have to talk some about the CAD tools in order to investigate what makes a good FPGA architecture and how can we use them well. So that's why I asked in the uh, in that questionnaire how many people are also taking uh, Jason Anderson's course on CAD. You don't have to take that course, but if I know a lot of people are taking it, it's it's useful because I know a lot of them understand that background. But I will give enough background in CAD tools that you're not disadvantaged. Um, okay, so. I'm sure none of you are here for the grades, but just in case you care, here's how you'll be evaluated. There'll be four assignments in the course. Um, they're you know kind of moderately open-ended. They're not completely open-ended, but each of them has some uh, optimization component where you can kind of get something working with a certain amount of effort, and then you can make it better with more. Uh, the first two assignments are kind of from that first part of the course. How do we how do we get the most of FPGA? So uh, design optimization on current FPG at the hardware description level. So Verilog or VHDL, it's easier to write in Verilog or system Verilog because the test benches you connect to, um, we write in that language. So if you really want to write in VHDL, you can, but it's a bit easier to write in system Verilog or Verilog. Uh, and a big focus is kind of comparing models for FPGAs, different ways to organize computation. So I'll we'll try a few of those different uh, program models to compare them. The last two assignments are kind of more from the, the course. How do we make these chips good? So the third assignment is uh, not a hardware design assignment. You're writing software. You're writing actually a CAD program. So the CAD program does a certain part of the FPGA CAD flow called RAM mapping. So you ask for certain kinds of RAM and a CAD tool figures out how can I implement that on this chip. And once you've written that tool, you try to make it optimized and then use it to invest a hot perspective. And then the fourth assignment is to use, you're not going to write a tool for that one. You're going to use a CAD tool called VTR. That's a pretty big CAD tool. So you would write in, the, in a single course and you're going to run that tool with a whole bunch of different input architectures to investigate uh some trends okay so there'll also be weekly reading assignments and that's worth 10 percent of your mark so on most weeks i'll assign one or two papers that are you know relevant to what we're going to talk about in the next lecture uh and you submit a one approximate on each so we ask maybe four questions for your thoughts on what they could do differently you have to do this on every one of the papers so uh We'll take the best 10 questionnaires that you submit, and we'll probably ask you to read about 20 50 papers. Um, not very many people read them all, but feel free. It's good for you to read them all and do all the questionnaires. Take the best 10 that you do. So you'll probably get 10 out of 10. And if you actually basically read every paper and submitted 22 questionnaires and they're all good, then I'm going to be very favorably disposed to round up your mark too. Um, 
But if you also find, well, it's just too much, I can't keep up with all the papers, that's fine. Then basically just pick the ones that are of most interest to you, make sure you read and submit questionnaires on at least 10. Uh, and finally, towards the end of the course, you're going to pick a subtopic that's somewhat somehow related to FPGAs or CAD tools or compute acceleration. It's pretty broad. The course covers a lot of different things, so I'm pretty flexible on exactly what the topic is. I'll give some ideas, but you can pick your own. And you'll read and summarize about 10 papers related to that topic. You can't summarize 10 papers in detail, so you're basically just giving a, a, an overview of uh, what those 10 papers say, doesn't have to be exactly 10, that's like a guideline. And then dive into two to four of them in more depth, saying these ones seem to have perhaps complementary approaches. Let's dive into those and summarize those. Uh, it's not that long, it's 3,000 words uh, or less. Okay, all of the work is individual. So all assignments are individual. It's good to discuss ideas with other students. You learn a lot from that. Um, but don't let that cross into, well, we just did a joint, some, we wrote this together or we uh, attack this assignment together. So if you're in doubt, ask me. Uh, the assignments are submitted on Quercus and they're run through actually is out of date. U of T changed from Turnitin to some other pleasure detection software. So it, they automatically get checked against basically all prior assignments in the universe uh, and all published papers that they can find. So you want to paraphrase. So we ask you a question uh, on the on one of these questionnaires. Don't take a paragraph from the paper and say, here it is, summarize it in your own words. If you want help, post on Piazza. Um, that's usually better than email, actually. You'll get a faster response from either Andrew or I. If it's a general question, doesn't reveal anything secret about your, your assignment that you want to keep secret, make it public. Other students might help you. Also, they might benefit from seeing the discussion. If you are going to post some of your, your code in, the, in it because you're kind of unsure why doesn't this work or can you help me in more detail, then make it a private post. Uh, email us as well. But usually Piazza will get a faster response. You can also ask me after class. Like if, you can, if you can find me, which is maybe harder these days in the pandemic than it used to be, you can ask me a question. Um, you can email to schedule a Zoom meeting uh, or if I'm on campus, an in-person meeting. And I'm going to have uh, a coffee time hours once a week where it's called coffee time because it's like, even if you feel like I don't have any real questions, Talk about FPGAs with somebody. I love that. Join the coffee time hour. You can talk about FPGAs as much as you like. Uh, if anything is unclear, let me know. Okay, so this is a high. My first time teaching this course in this this way, where we're trying to do it both in person and online, and hopefully have a good experience for for both formats. Tell me if something's not working, right? So I want to know. I don't want to just here no one can understand what i'm saying but no one will tell me uh then post all the lectures we start i guess most of you are u of t u of t has a unique time zone or 10 minutes after the hour okay so classes you know on the hour or in this case on the half hour and then so the students can actually get class. the next class can't start right away so they always start 10 minutes after the hour i actually spent uh many years in industry so i i started a company and then i was at all is now part of Intel for 11 years. And through all those years, I was never able to reset my, my internal clock to start in the hour at Terra. Things started on the hour and I had meetings with this chief operating officer and the head of engineering that I was incapable of getting to on time for reasons I cannot fully understand. Uh, we're gonna start at 10 minutes after the hour. And you're gonna find pretty much all your classes do the same thing. Um, before class, I'll post uh, the slides and scans of the notes that I use to go on the chalkboard, because it's possible the chalkboard won't show up super well on video. Um, yeah, if, as I said, it's great to have interaction. So ask questions, answer questions. There are no uh, participation marks, so you're not going to be directly rewarded for that, but it'll be a better learning experience. Uh, and I do take it into consideration, like it's kind of a tiebreaker at the end of the course. If I know you like participated a lot, then I just have a generally good feeling about, well, you know, this, this, this person would be great to round up a letter grade. Um, I already mentioned this. There's a link on the virtual call. I'm going to switch now to uh, talking about why, uh, why do we use FPGAs? Why do these things exist? Any questions on the course structure? Actually, I guess one last thing I should mention. OK, so I talked about there are four assignments, um, you know, hardware design, HTML design, um, CAD tool design and running CAD tools. You can do all of 
Okay, so. In on your laptop. I think. Let's see, but uh, yeah, so if you're kind of trying to do a lot of things online, it is possible to do all of the assignments without physically being in the lab. Okay, so any questions on it so far? Can people hear me? Okay, so someone in the back row. Uh, I'm going to pick on you. Sorry. Can you hear me? Oh, excellent. Any question? Yeah, so what I do normally is I just post them with each assignment. You'll be given two to three weeks for every assignment. Um, and I haven't published a late policy. Basically, it's good to submit it on time so you don't fall behind. With COVID, I'm, you know, if, you, if there's some reason why it's going to be a hardship, send me an email, right? Better to send me, send me the email before you hit the deadline, okay? But it's better to get them all in on time because, you know, things kind of snowball. Um, but that said, I am being somewhat flexible in COVID. If you basically say, look, I got to, for this reason, could I have a little bit extra time? Send me an email, okay? Any other questions like on any of that? Okay, so let's talk about, uh, I'm gonna turn off the projector for a little while then. And so I have more lap screen. Okay, so basic question. Okay, so why do these things exist? Why FPGAs? Now you may not know, how many, how many people here know what an FPGA is? Use them in undergrad, okay? So most people, uh, but maybe you don't know them super well. Okay, so you have some familiarity with them, but why do they exist? Um, and I guess the alternative, well, what do you think the alternative would be? If it didn't exist, the world wouldn't end, what would people use instead? Kind of a couple other things people, but yeah, so you could use an ASIC. So you could build a custom chip, which has certain strengths and weaknesses that I'll talk about in a little while, uh, or a GPU. So you could use a GPU. And I would say a GPU is a special case of, of a processor. Okay, so it's, um, you know, it's a form of processor that's good at certain styles of parallel repetitive processing. Um, so the, that general class would be processors, which would include GPUs. So uh, anyone else have a comment on that? Yeah. CPLDs, I would, I, nowadays, I just kind of ca call those FPGAs. So as I mentioned, I worked at Altera for many years, which was, is now part of Intel. For legal reasons, Altera called their FPGAs CPLDs until uh, basically they settled a big lawsuit with Xilinx. Xilinx and Altera were suing each other like mad for about 10 years, along with most of the other FPGA companies. They all, like, it was a, very, it was a sport. Uh, and when I was at Altera during some of that, and uh, when the tech downturn happened in the year 2000, um, basically Altera CEO looked at, at the books and said that we're spending $5 million a quarter on this lawsuit with Xilinx and then some other money on other companies. So, uh, and Xilinx presumably was still uh, spending the same amount of money. So they went and basically settled the license lawsuit. Uh, and it was interesting. It wasn't that hard in the end. They basically said, okay, we have lots of patents. You have lots of patents. We're gonna cross license each other's patents. So that was the end of it. Um, which, yeah, spending tens of millions of dollars per year in litigation for no apparent purpose just because you had excess profits was kind of an interesting thing to do. And as soon as that was done, Altera basically just said, yeah, we're making FPGAs, right? Like, we don't have to call them CPLDs anymore because uh, they're no longer suing each other. Uh, CPLDs did start out as kind of simpler FPGAs, but I'd say nowadays, I just consider them another kind of programmable logic. But, but that's a good, good thought. Okay, so why FPGAs? Um, and I guess we'll talk, why do we have FPGAs instead of like just ASICs? Because that's one of the alternatives that, uh, that you know, Stephen just mentioned. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna focus on processors. Like ASICs, they're expensive, take a lot of skill to make a custom chip. So for a lot of companies, that's not gonna be an option, but a processor is an option for everybody. 
Okay, so why don't I use processors for everything? Okay, so why not microprocessors? Okay, and we are gonna use, obviously microprocessors are used for lots of stuff. This is not gonna be an answer that you never use a microprocessor. This is a question of why don't we use a microprocessor for like just absolutely everything. So any ideas? Why don't we use microprocessors for absolutely everything? I've got basically two big categories that I can think of of reasons. So I think back there, Ashley. Right, right. So one of the reasons is performance. So we could run it on a processor, uh, but it's not fast enough. And there are many ways that you can say performance. It could be performance per dollar. It could be performance per watt. Um, sometimes you care about absolute performance. Sometimes more commonly you actually care about, you know, one or both of these things. Okay, so, so we're gonna talk about yeah, let's talk about that a fair amount. Okay, so you said it's because it's serial, and that's that's an yeah, it's an important insight. So the way processors work, let me give you a little example. Okay, so I'm just gonna write a really simple program. I got a simple computation to do. I want to rapidly compute answers to the quadratic equation. Let's say I've got some system that needs high performance on that. Um, they might say, well, it seems kind of too simple. When you look at things like wireless processing, there are not exactly the quadratic equation, but there are a lot of very repetitive calculations that happen on streams of data. So you have lots of data coming off an antenna, it's digitized at a high rate, and you do things like this on every single piece of data. So you actually do need to do it fast. Um, Okay, so the first thing is I should factor that. Okay, so I can rewrite that with fewer operations. Um, especially multiplies are expensive in hardware, so I don't want to use too many multiplies. So I wrote it, it's going to be a little easier to compute. How is this going to be done in a microprocessor? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna draw like a really simple cartoon microprocessor just to kind of emphasize how it differs from the typical way people use FPGAs. So a microprocessor, I'm gonna register file. Okay, so I have several different values in this uh, at different locations. So the register file has two read ports. So on any given clock, two things out of it. I have an arithmetic logic unit. So this is a unit that I built the addition, multiplication, a few other things. Okay, so I need to have some control signals to tell it what to do because it does different things. I'm also going to need some control signals, some addresses to basically say what to take out of the register file every cycle. Uh, and generally, I can't compute, you know, this entire function in one clock cycle with just one pass through this ALU. The ALU does think it can do a multiply or it could do an add, but it can't do all of this. So I'm going to have to go through multiple steps, storing intermediate results back to the register file. So I need to have a write port. So from the ALU, I can get it back. Okay, and let's say I make my processor work on 32-bit words. So all of these buses are 32 bits wide. My register is 32 bits wide. Okay, let's bring out these control signals. Okay, and then I basically am going to drive these control signals with an instruction stream in time. So I could say, uh, let's make a temporary one. So I'll say that maybe address zero, I'm going to store temporary one. I'm going to load the value of X, right, from some input into it, instruction. Then I'm going to make another temporary. Okay, so temporary two, I'll say maybe that's address one. And I'm going to say, okay, I need to take A times X. And my ALU can do multiply, or it could do an add, but can't do both. Let's just say that's the, my processor. Whoops. 
So I say T2 becomes A times T1. That's just going to draw all of my control signals. It's going to say uh, I want to I want the right address to be address one, because that's where I put T2. I want the read address to be um, T1, one of these inputs. And the other one is going to have to be where A is. So there's A in my register file as well. Okay, then I need to do pass through this a few more times. So I can say T2 becomes T2 plus B. Okay, so I better store B in here. Okay, so now I've computed this part. Uh, I need to multiply by X. Um, I still have X in my T1. I'll say T2 becomes T2 times T1. And now I'm almost done. I just need to add in C. Okay, so I'll store C in my register file and uh, y is T2 plus C. And I didn't leave room for Y, so I'm going to make the register file a little bit bigger so I can put Y in there. Okay, now I've got my output in the register file. I might want to send it to the outside world, so I also need to have you know, this, this output connected to the outside world or something connected to the outside world to get this out of there. Okay, so this is my instruction stream. Uh, and this is the cleverness of, of processors. They build a relatively, well, for a simple processor anyway, a relatively small amount of hardware, right? So some memory, uh, an execution unit, some multiplexing, and they use it in time in order to complete uh, possibly a very complicated computation. Um, so that's called temporal calculations. Okay, so processors probably don't call it that, but in the FPGA world, you call this a temporal calculation because it's time steps, right? You need to do more complicated computation. You can use the same hardware, but you need to have more time steps, more instructions. So with my simple processor, it basically highlights um, exactly what you said, um, sequential, right? It's occurring in many steps. So it's gonna take, too many, but one, two, three, four, five, you know, five passes through the processor. So if every one of those is a clock cycle, it took five so clock cycles. Um, so yeah, the sequential is a, it's very efficient in hardware. You can actually do very complicated computations with a processor that doesn't take all that much area. You know, the register file would get bigger. Maybe I'd eventually need off memory, but this is very efficient in terms of the size of the hardware that I need. But it does slow down the more complex the calculation is. Um, anything else that, so now we're gonna, I'm not, this is a very simple processor. Clearly processors employ all sorts of tricks to try to get faster, okay? So, but they are still at their core, there's a sequential element of running through instructions. Um, anything else in here that is not great from scaling performance? Yeah. So the multiply, because I've got only one of them. Is that right? Uh, that's true. Yeah. So this multiply does take more time. So the way I've drawn it here, where the multiply takes, you know, one cycle and goes back is going to limit me, right? So you're right. Now processors, both processors and FPGAs can do some things to help with that. Like, so we're gonna talk about pipelining. Um, but as processors do that, their model of how to execute does also get more complicated. So basically performance processors start getting a bit more messy, uh, but that's a good point. So the multiplier is a bottleneck, it's relatively slow. Anything else in here that, hmm, it's a kind of a difficult question. So, there's, there's another part here that makes this difficult to scale up. Processors do all sorts of tricks to get faster. So they're kind of marvels of engineering as well. Um, but they, 
at least in a simple processor like this, and even really complicated processors share this to some extent, my state is centralized. Okay, so I've got the centralized state. Um, so it's convenient. I've got all of my data stored in this one register file. So my ALU can get all of it. It can put data back anywhere. And it helps me structure my computation very nicely. But as my state gets big, so I'm doing a big computation, um, this register file will get large. And if you make a register file large, it starts getting slower. It's not just that it gets bigger. All of the wiring inside of it, the address decoders, the word lines, the bit lines, we'll talk later in the course, but Rams, this gets slower. You also, um, if you're trying to make this faster by saying, I'm not going to have one multiplier, I'm going to have two multipliers. Okay. And if I have two multipliers, I'm going to need probably four read ports instead of just two, because otherwise I can't get data to my two multipliers. So I can make my processor faster by saying, I don't just one thing at a time. Maybe I can do several operations at a time. Uh, but with the central state, what that means is more read ports and more write ports. And that also makes the register file bigger and it also makes it slower. Uh, you basically get all sorts of more wiring and, uh, and it fundamentally slows down, okay? So they can, they can get less, well, so basically the centralized state is a bottleneck because everybody's trying to get data from the same spot. It's very convenient from a program abstraction. And here I'm doing it all on chip. So for really big computations, you know, a, a register file just gets ridiculously huge you, to off-chip memory. Off-chip memory is still a bottleneck though. It's a nice abstraction of I just send an address and I eventually get the data, but that now takes a while. I have to send it to some off-chip, uh, typically DRAM, which is relatively slow to respond. So a lot of processor architecture is how you take this centralized state and try to actually distribute it across caches, uh, and in GPUs, you'll say, well, I'm going to actually split some of it up. Instead of having one register file, I'll have a whole bunch of different register files or multi have multiple register files. You're gradually making your program model more complicated um, to make this central bottleneck less severe. Okay. Um, yeah, so I don't want to imply that the processors stayed at this simple level, but they do have this fundamental, the thing that makes them easy to program and hardware efficient is the central centralized state and the sequential execution. And then different processors will take different trade-offs of, well, how much do they kind of break away from that in order to get more performance, but make programming harder? So Andrew, was there a question online? Oh, okay, we've gone. I think I probably shouldn't have done that. So is that, let me see what people are saying in the chat. Uh, is the audio better now? Let's see. I guess you can't tell because I'm not speaking. Okay, so let me just say something. And is the, is the audio getting better? I can move this closer to my mouth if that helps. Okay, I think I put my glasses on top of the microphone. Sorry, so uh, have it. Um, a challenge of with the mask my glasses up i take my mask off i uh glasses off i tend to put them on the microphone so i am learning how to do these things uh okay so i guess that just um okay so process can get some more parallelism than this by becoming more sophisticated but then they're not quite such a nice abstraction okay so let's compare that to uh spatial hardware Um, yeah, so where we don't use the processor abstraction, uh, processor is hardware, but we basically want to do something that's doesn't have an instruction. Okay, so it's going to be a different kind of hardware. So if I just write this in pure hardware, like I wrote it in, in system Verilog, for example, 
I can write it as an X value comes in, and it goes into a multiplier. Uh, they're both inputs of the multiplier, so I computed X squared. I'm also going to multiply it with B. Then I'm going to take this. So that was that just computed X squared. I can multiply that with A with another multiplier. Okay, I can add that to C. I could do that with an ALU, but I actually have to build a full ALU. I could just build something that only does addition because I know that all I ever need to do is add this B times X plus C. Yeah, so at this point, I've got AX squared, I've got BX plus C. So I just add those together. Okay. Again, I could do that with an ALU, but I don't really need to. I could just build an adder. Only thing I can do is add. And I get my output. Okay, so this is like a natural way to write uh, Verilog or VHD. Okay, is it parallel or is it temporal? Like, does it execute in steps or is it parallel? Yeah, so this is intrinsically parallel. Okay, so we call it a spatial computation. Um, is it a spatial computation? Well, we've made multiple compute units connected by wires and they're spread out on the piece of silicon. And even more importantly, there's no central state. So here you can say all my state is in the register file. Everything else is just sequencing operations through the hardware and, and guiding and running through the same hardware over and over again. Here, my state is all over the place. This is where X squared stored. This is where AX squared is stored. This is where the final answer is stored. Okay, so there's no central state. Uh, and that's one of the ways you can get performance. Um, we don't have that bottleneck anymore. We also can use specialized operators. Instead of building ALUs all over the place, we built multipliers in certain spots, we built adders in other spots. Every unit of hardware only does exactly what it needs to do. Okay, so we can use specialized operators. Like adder instead of an ALU. Um, why? Why? Why do I? Why would I want to use specialized operator? Would it be easier for me just to use an ALU for everything? Is there any advantage? Yeah. Yeah. So it's smaller, and it also usually has less delay. So it's basically smaller and usually faster. Okay. So this is this going to be faster for computation? Let's say I just wanted to send one video in and get one Y. Is this hardware faster than this processor? Yeah, it probably is. I think it's faster. Yeah. Yeah. So basically you would look at, well, what's the maximum propagation delay through it? And it's probably this path, right? So this goes through one multiplier, a second multiplier, one adder. And you do to go through two multiplier delays and an adder delay. In this, I had to go through five instructions, which meant I went through uh, five ALU delays, each of which is going to be at least as big as, as the maximum of multiplier and adder, plus I have to access the register file. Uh, and accessing the register file takes some time and some multiplexing. Um, that, well, I guess here I haven't shown any multiplexing. It's all just accessing the register file. So let's just leave it at accessing the register file takes time. So yeah, it will find faster 
Yeah, so the overall heart is faster. Now this is only, maybe it's three times faster, right? Instead of five ALU delay is registered stuff only two multiple acts. Maybe it's three, maybe it's four, maybe it's even five. Um, but it, it is faster, but it does take more area, right? It's, I guess it's a little unclear here. Got rid of the register file, but it did build more functional units. So in this case, probably it's more area, but it's a bit unclear. If this computation got very large, like very many steps, then this is going to eventually become larger. Is there is an area trade-off here. The processor is very space efficient for calculations. Um, you, what we really care about usually though, is if I only wanted to compute one value of Y from one value of X once in a while, then I probably wouldn't bother doing this because I don't need that much throughput. So I can basically have the processor do it and the processor can do other things too. Whereas this only does one thing. So if I don't need that much throughput, I'm probably not going to do that. Just do the processor style. So where hardware uh, really shines when you need high throughput is what's called streaming hardware. Andrew? Okay, so there's multiple, multiple good points there. So I've got a pretty simple processor here. This processor is not pipelined. So it basically does in one clock cycle, you go through the multiplier and, or ALU, you go through your register file access, et cetera. But you're right, you can pipeline this, which we're gonna, we're gonna talk about in a, a few minutes, where you say that takes multiple cycles and now your clock frequency can be higher and your processor can be working on multiple things at once. So that's a form of parallelism that's common processors. It'll make this more efficient. I can do the same thing here, though, which is what I'm going to do in a minute. Of we can actually pipeline to make it more efficient. So pipelines are a powerful technique for both processors and for spatial hardware, but it probably works even better for spatial hardware. Spatial hardware because it doesn't have things like this central register file, which becomes a bottleneck for your clock period. You just wind up with it hard to make that register file fast enough. Uh, and if you take, and it's difficult to register where you need multi-cycle access. You get certain spots down in the details of how you build this RAM, you don't have a place you can pipeline from. So I guess I, my answer to that is you're completely right. I can make this processor faster with pipelining. I'm ignoring that for now because I'm comparing basically a simple processor to simple spatial hardware. But I'm going to pipeline the spatial hardware in a little while too. Uh, your other comment was that the clock period of the process is usually faster than FPGA. Also true. I'm going to talk about that in a little while too because that's essentially the other competitor to an FPGA, which is custom chips. Processors could be built on an FPGA and they are built on it. But more commonly, they're built as custom chips which means that you can clock them faster when they're a custom chip. So you're gonna gain back some of your performance loss from the fact that you really optimize this processor. Um, hopefully that partly answers your question. Those are really, we're gonna talk about those for a while, right? Like what are those trade-offs? Okay, don't go that far because it's gonna to be too hard to see. Okay, so let me, thank you. Okay, so now I want to talk about streaming hardware. So the title is over there. So a stream, stream of data flows through. So that's where we probably care more about high performance, like that wireless processing case that I told you about, cell phone base station. Um, So we've got some calculation to do, and we want to do it once, do it maybe 100 million times a second, forever. Okay, so now we start caring a lot about the efficiency of that calculation. 
So when that happens, uh, we want a pipeline for higher performance. Okay, so let me go back over here. Um, how many people are pipeline hardware in, in, in your undergraduate degree or, or middle school already? Okay, so quite a few. How many people are not sure what I mean? So, um, so pipelining is basically dividing up your work into multiple block periods. You put additional registers into your design so that you take multiple clock periods to get a result, but your hardware can be uh, clocked faster. Every piece of your hardware is working on a different input, essentially. So for this hardware that I've shown you, so let's say, well, maybe I'll draw it again. Maybe it's messy. Okay, so basically I'm not just sending one X in now. I'm gonna send in a whole bunch of inputs over time. Okay, so X is time step zero, X is time step one, X is time step two, et cetera. So that's my new input. And if I look at this, where would you put registers to try to pipeline this? So the goal is basically, right? I can't send a new X in until I've got a stable Y value. So that means I need to wait two multiplier delays and an adder delay or a multiplier delay and two adder delays, plus all the wire delays. But I have to make sure that whatever the longest delay through any of this is, that my clock period is longer than that. Otherwise, I could have data corruption. I send some new input in before I've captured the old output, and um, a disaster happens. Okay? So I put a bunch of different X values in in a sequence. I want to clock this as fast as possible. How can I add register clock this faster, but still get the correct answer? So if you just say add registers at random, you will not get the same answer. Um, so where would you pipeline this? Yeah. Okay, so you want to put a register there. Over here, you want to put one? Here. That looks good. Um, and yeah, I can also put more. I mean, I haven't done this right now. I guess implicitly there's probably a register out there, but let's explicitly put it right there. And let's explicitly put uh, registers on the inputs here. Okay, so let's put a register. And we'll put a register, and put a register there. Okay. Um, so I just filled in the other places you had. Does this produce the same answer as before? It just delayed one, two, three, four clock cycles if I count all the registers. Does it, do I get the same answer? Yeah, so this actually works. It doesn't change any of my outputs. How fast can I clock this? So what, what determines my delay now? What do you think? How much faster? Well, you can't really answer this, how much faster, but what, what do you think is going to determine the delay now? Yeah, so, yeah, it's an impossible to answer question, right? Multipliers are more complicated than adders, so probably that. But I've gone from two multipliers plus an adder down to just one multiplier. Uh, I've also cut some wires in half, so my wiring delay has also been reduced, so probably the clock is about three times as fast. Um, how much area did you just add? So you added these registers. Um, registers do take some area. These are all buses, so this X value is in the example, I've given 32 bits. So every one of these registers is really 32-bit register. What do you think? Do you think you've added a lot of area, a little area? Hard to say. Yeah, I mean, putting you on the spot was sort of impossible to answer questions. Generally, a multiplier is pretty big. A 32-bit uh, multiplier is pretty big. Addition of these registers, it is going to have some impact on area for sure, but it's probably well under doubling. The other thing you're going to see is 
is is FPGA because they really like pipeline. Because uh, uh, you're right that FPGAs tend to have lower clock frequency because um, they're so highly programmable. And we'll see when the, we look at how they're built, why that is. Um, they basically, instead of connecting things directly with them, they actually put transistors in there so you can actually switch them, but that slows everything down. Because of that, FPGAs love pipelining. Okay, so they have lots of registers inside the chip. FPGA, these registers are relatively cheap. Okay, mostly because everything else is more expensive. Right, the wiring is more expensive because it has transistors in it. Uh, so in a custom chip, say, but this would be probably well under, like much less than double the area. In an FPGA, it could have a negligible impact on area because of the fact that there are so many in the chip, uh, of the way they're designed. So it's a very good, um, yeah, it's a very good way to in space hardware. Okay, so let's say this output, I should mention this too. Stream of outputs, well, I guess I have it over here. My stream of inputs, I have that whole thing uh, and it produces stream of outputs. Yeah, Andrew, was there a question? That's actually a good point. So this, there's nothing that says that we have to stop at this point. We could now say, put registers in the middle of that multiplier, put registers in the middle of this multiplier, uh, put registers in the middle of that multiplier, uh, and it'll be faster. Is what I just did legal, by the way? Yeah, yeah, so people, it has, what I just did is actually not quite legal because I didn't add the same number of registers. I didn't add the same amount of latency to all paths through my circuit, okay? For pipelining to be legal, I have to add the same amount of latency through every single path in my circuit. And I'll give you a few rules on that in uh, next lecture when we get into programming models. So for it to be correct, I'd actually have to add one more register here. If I put registers in the middle of my multipliers. I don't really need this. You know, you'd look at it and you go from a timing point of view, like I already have a register. I just stuck another register in front of it. Probably doesn't help me at timing, it's just area. If I didn't do that though, I have a correctness issue because I added two cycles of latency here and I added one cycle of latency there. So these signals are gonna be out of sync, which means I'm not gonna be adding the right things. I have two streams of data. I've gotta keep them. Well, I've got one stream of data here that's being split into two pieces. I need to keep them aligned. So as I start pipelining really deeply to speed up something, I might have to put more registers on other paths that I kind of wish I didn't have to put in because they're not helping my timing but I have to do it for correctness. Uh, question? Okay, but by doing all of this uh, streaming and basically just cut the clock cycle. Okay, so if I don't pipeline super deeply, like I put in three stages of pipelining at first, I probably cut my clock rate almost a factor of three. Um, so I'm gonna get a lot more throughput. I did add some area, but those registers won't be a factor of three area. So from an area delay point of view, which is kind of a good metric of efficiency, uh, it's a win. Okay, so, and basically with the streaming model is continuously streaming through. So pipeline is really good for streaming computations like this because basically I'm gonna do the same thing to every single element, uh, which means I, yeah, this, this pipelining works extremely well. If I only needed to get, I have an X that comes in once in a while in the middle of some other computation and then Y to make any further progress, pipeline doesn't really help me, okay? Cause I don't need like a hundred million X values turned into Y values. I need like one once in a while. Um, so if I, I don't really have any other X values to stick into this pipeline while I'm waiting for the first one to turn into a Y. So the pipelining was not useful. For a stream of data, it's very useful. Andrew, was there another question or? No, okay. Um, the other thing that I wanna point out is basically, we can now draw a box around both. And I could call that operator 
okay? So if that was my operator gamma, I can basically use that as a building block, like a module, and I can build more complicated calculations. Okay, so the reason I gave this a name is to show a way that you can compose uh, spatial hardware. Okay, so say I've still got my X stream. Maybe that's coming from a radio on a, on a wireless base station to get like an antenna. Um, and the first thing I need to do is some operator that I haven't defined yet called alpha, but gamma, because that's what I just called it. So and it produces my Y value, which I just showed you. Maybe run that through another couple of uh, operations. There's some other alpha things that I need to do to produce some particular output. If it's a beta uh, to produce another output, uh, and so on. So basically, instead of just computing some quadratic function of x, I compute that, and then I compute a function of that, and then I compute a fun another function of it. So I'm building a more complicated calculation. Okay, so what happened as I, as I did this, does my output stream, so I've now got these two new output streams here, do they slow down? Or do they come out at the same rate they used to come out? So basically, if I was able to block this circuit, uh, say 100 megahertz, then I, then I can take input at 100 million inputs per second and produce 100 million outputs per second. Uh, now let's say that I, was able to make this alpha beta also clock at 100 megahertz. So I pipeline them carefully, they run fast. It, can I still send in 100 million samples per second uh, and get these outputs at 100 million outputs per second? So yeah, I can. So it doesn't slow down at all, okay? So the reason it doesn't slow down is basically we've increased parallelism. We've gone for a more complicated calculation and we've just built additional cascaded modules, all of them pipelined. So our clock period didn't drop, our parallelism increased, and therefore we're able to do a more complicated calculation without throughput going down. So this way of spatially composing hardware naturally increases parallelism. Okay. You have to design this beta and alpha well, otherwise they could drop your clock frequency. But if you basically do as good a job as you did for your original one, there's no reason your clock frequency should drop. Um, and it's basically because there's no central storage bottleneck. In a processor, if I decided that I want to try to do three times as much stuff in the same amount of time, I have a problem trying to get three times as much stuff out of my central storage. Uh, that is not an easy design challenge at all. So this is where this, the fact that there's no central storage is very helpful. Um, it's kind of just obvious how to get more, well, how to maintain your throughput even as things get more complicated by stamping out hardware that is connected together spatially. Okay, so we kind of never get a spatial, uh, central storage bottleneck. It just gets spread out on our whole chip. Uh, okay, so this isn't the only compute model. So I told you that in a lecture or so, we're going to start talking about compute models. So I just told you about a particular one called streaming hardware and another one for called sequential execution. Those are not the only models, but they're very popular ones. Streaming hardware is very efficient on FPGAs and, and sequential execution is you know, a very area efficient way to run a processor. Um, so I basically just want to show these to you as two extremes of why have um, hardware that's not processors. 
is to be able to employ compute models like streaming hardware and get more efficiency. Okay, so now that shows you that streaming hardware is good. Uh, should we make every hardware? I guess we started off asking, should we just make everything processors? You know, course, course ended, right? You've all got, got credit, we're done, right? And we happily came to the conclusion, no, there are reasons that we shouldn't just do that. Um, but now that I've shown you that streaming hardware can be very high parallelism naturally, no central storage ball. Actually, we make everything out of streaming hardware. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. So basically, like, first answer is no, right? So you're saying no, don't make everything streaming hardware, and you're right. And one of your reasons is basically, um, yeah, can't reuse, at least the way I've designed it here, which is very efficient, but it's also very restrictive, it does one thing. So can't reuse for different computation. Whereas a processor is incredibly good at being reused for different computations. You just change the instructions. And the instructions, so if you, have, if you need more instructions, because you need more subroutines, um, you need more if statements, your area does go up some because you need you know, main, more main memory or bigger register files, but it's a relatively slow growth because uh, instructions that can be stored very densely on chip. So as if you need a whole variety of different computations of streaming hardware, your area is going to grow quite quickly. You're building different units for everything. Um, Although, in my defense, we had to so far, so far today, Andrew and I had to go find a back door to get into the room, uh, and then found that it's under construction. So, so we're doing reasonably well so far. Um, okay, so yeah. Real quickly. So the other thing, the other side of this kind of spatial composition is yes, my throughput didn't drop, so my parallelism is naturally increasing. My area is also naturally increasing. So sometimes that's fine, and it's what you want. Sometimes it's not. Okay. So we also can have well, any other reasons why um, streaming hardware is always not a good idea. So use it for computations. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what if you you can get new inputs for hardware very often. Um, probably get it once in a while, but it's just not that common. Uh, then you don't need. And the speed isn't free, especially if the computation is relatively complicated. You know, this style of computation lays it all out in space, so it's pretty big. So we don't want to do that if we actually don't benefit from the speed. You'd be better off using a processor. Uh, anything else? Any other reasons? Any other things where a processor is really good? Yeah. The is good from a programming point of view. Yeah, so it's got a, it's, so actually that's another good, like maybe design effort. Yeah, we're gonna talk about programming models, we'll talk about a few different ones. Probably processors have the easiest to use programming model of all, um, especially a simple processor like this. Something like a GPU, it's programming considerably more complicated, but it's because it started to break some of the processor abstraction. It's state is centralized anymore, for example. And that actually makes it faster for certain calculations, but also makes it harder to program. 
So having all your state in one spot, your instructions can get at them. Uh, you know, it's basically, it's hard to beat a processor, especially a relatively simple processor. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Right. So I'll say, say data dependent or serial algorithms. Kind of two words for basically the same thing. So in this nice spatial hardware that I drew here, so well, this one was doing the quadratic equation, right? Didn't have any data dependency. It was all math. There was no if statement. There was no do this, if that. Um, but you often wind up with those kind of branches. And if you have data dependencies, then your pipeline is, pipelining is no longer so simple, right? You're, you can't decide what to do until you get a complete result and decide what to do next. If you have really data dependent serial algorithms, it's hard to beat a processor, okay? You can beat it by some, if you basically build a hardware unit that only does that, but not by that much, and it's a lot bigger. Uh, processors, because of the fact that they're kind of fundamentally sequential and are really optimized, okay? The resources that companies Intel and AMD put on uh, optimizing the hardware to the clock it as fast as possible is huge. So you're um, generally not gonna beat a processor if you've got serial or data dependent algorithm. Yeah, so because they're just really good at branching, right? They throw a ton of hardware at that and really optimized. Um, let's see. So I guess this is it. streaming hardware not being reusable for different computations. Another way to processor is uh, for low throughput. You know, that may be less true if you have to do all sorts of tricks to try to make it faster, but you don't need high throughput. It's very, very efficient. Particularly if it's a complicated calculation or lots of different calculations, and it doesn't have to be all that fast. It's really hard to beat a processor for that. Okay, so hopefully I've now convinced you, yeah, there is no one right answer. Processors aren't always best. Streaming hardware isn't always best. Um, should we make a mixed device? Should we make something with a bit of both? Because each of them is strong, okay? And I see people nodding their heads. So yeah, usually when they're kind of trade off, something in the middle is usually the best. So should we make a mixed device? Okay, and yeah, basically that is a good, good approach, okay? So if we have some regular competitive calculations that we need high throughput, okay, we make streaming hardware for that. And there are a lot of repetitive calculations. So I've talked a bunch about wireless processing because that's a big market for FPGAs. It also consumes a lot of silicon um, because the way you're getting more and more data phone is actually ever more complex wireless protocols that require ever more um, computation on every bit of data that comes across the antenna. Um, networks, another example of highly uh, repetitive calculations where a general processor, you're kind of wasting a lot of its hardware, constantly saying, what should I do next? What you do next is largely what you just did, just do it again. Um, so there are a lot of, where a lot of our computation goes is repetitive, high throughput nowadays. Um, but not all of it. So we're gonna have some control tasks, some serial tasks, some low throughput tasks. Okay, and those basically fit a microprocessor uh, really well. So we could build a chip where we just divide up our area and we might have multiple things we wanna do, maybe some wireless processing, 
So maybe that's our spring hardware unit one. Uh, maybe we want to do some neural acceleration of a certain type. Where unit two, lots of different protocols. So maybe we need another unit. Micro everything else. Anything we can think of? Because there's always risk putting you know, your algorithms into hardware, what if they change? You know, somebody comes with a new idea or the standards change or whatever, and your hardware no longer does what you need. So microprocessor is some of an insurance policy. It can do anything. Uh, it can also handle these other tasks, but it's not gonna do them as efficiently. Um, so what do you think? Does this, do people build chips like this today? Yeah, this is what modern ASICs look like. So at the very start of the class, I mentioned the other competitor to FPGA is just build a custom chip. Right, so something that's you probably don't know exactly how reprogrammable an FPGA is yet, but we'll talk about that next. They're, they're reprogrammable at a very fundamental level where you can essentially rewire them, but that comes at a cost. Um, so you could build a custom chip. If you build a custom chip, you almost never build it all as streaming hardware because it's so risky. Right? You get one thing wrong, you didn't think of one thing, or there's some calculations that fit this other paradigm. And it's a disaster, and it's a really expensive disaster. Uh, so modern ASICs basically look like this. They'll have microprocessors, usually a bunch of them, to handle parts of the calculations, because that's the only way you can um, essentially stay current and have something that's not ridiculously risky. OK? Um, this modern ASIC. The ASIC stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. So you custom manufactured circuit to do something more specialized than you know, just an Intel processor or an NVIDIA GPU. It's not entirely, I mean, even an NVIDIA GPU is often considered an ASIC. So kind of means custom chip that tries not to do absolutely everything. Um, but there's still actually a bunch of risk to this. So we've, we've reduced our risk by putting in multiple accelerators and putting in a microprocessor. Uh, the things we didn't think of. We still have to make a lot of decisions. Okay, so basically it's modern ASIC because it's, it basically balances uh, and flexibility. Okay, if we knew exactly what this would be doing, you know, we might put it to the size. We only build that one streaming unit, but too risky or too narrow a market. Um, we still have lots of things to decide on. So there's still a lot of risk that we're gonna get wrong. Okay, so can't put usually you know, 20 different streaming hardware units on here because it's too much area. Chip will be too big. So we have to, you know, specific. Specific streaming hardware units. And usually only a few. Got to make our guesses. And there's another thing, we need to make sure we connect them in a way where we can get our job done. Maybe it turns out that we're, we're targeting some, some wireless standard that changed at the last minute in the next generation and the streaming hardware you almost do it, but not quite. So it needs to send some data to the microprocessor a certain step and get it back. If we didn't actually connect that internal data to the microprocessor, we, we actually still can't do it, right? The microprocessor in theory can do anything but actually can't get at that state. That state's buried in this unit. Um, we could reduce by saying, well, these streaming heart units are all gonna write out to a central state and they're gonna read from a central state. And that's also connected to the microprocessor. So now everybody can see everybody's state, but that's not sufficient. We just created a central storage bottleneck that's slower, more area, et cetera. So, um, so we basically have to make some other decisions. How do we connect these things together? And the most flexible ways to connect them together are also the most area hungry and the most performance limiting. Um, 
Okay. So could you central storage? Um, it's flexible, but really big and slow. At the other extreme, we could just have fixed connections where certain things connect to each other, which is wires and registers. Um, but that's really easy to just get wrong. Okay, so let's see. I'm gonna break there for like, take a seven minute break till uh, 5.30, because uh, you probably need a little bit of time to relax. This was like the bigger reason of why do FPGAs exist, okay? Um, so that you can, you can get these more efficient programming models. So streaming hardware and deeply pipelined is the one we just talked about. There's another reason they exist, like another very fundamental reason they exist. So your challenge in the next six or seven minutes is think about that. There's another reason that's not related to performance, just as can you actually do it? People don't think about it as much, but it's another big reason why the FPGA industry exists. Uh, I'll tell you the answer in six minutes if you don't get it. So, uh, so let's talk again at 5.30. Back, yeah. I guess there are, yeah, that is a good reason, um, which we're also going to talk about. Okay, so hold that thought because there are issues of like efficiency in terms of design and uh, um, cost effectiveness to get the first unit out, and mostly against the custom chip. Okay, so a processor is an incredibly productive design environment. If a processor does what you want, you generally just can't beat it for design efficiency. So. So can you think of anything a processor can't do? We talked about how it sometimes can't get you the performance you need. Is there anything else you just can't do? Yeah. Let's go to the back, actually, and I'll give you a shot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's the other, other big thing. So, so most, most people think about hardware efficiency in terms of, yeah, did I get the performance I need? But the other big reason that FPGAs exist um, compared to processors is, okay, this is way back to that whole thing was 0.1, 0.2 is basically IO. Okay, so there are a huge number of different ways that you connect chips together um, at the electrical level, at the timing level, at the protocol level. Uh, so, you may not be able to go buy a processor that can actually connect to everything you want. So again, I'm, the FPGA industry really likes uh, base stations. So say you can't connect to the antennas. Modern base stations have antennas stuck all over the place. If you actually can't connect to the electrical protocol that they're using, you can't fit in that environment. If you're going in a car and you're monitoring uh, some of the sensors uh, in the catalytic converter and the engine and so on, and they have an interface that you can't find a processor that has the right mix of all those interfaces. And maybe you're also going to connect to your own custom sensor. That's part of what your company wants to do. Like you do not have an option, right? A processor has fixed IOs. They usually have a bunch of different kinds of IOs to give you more chance that you can connect to what you want. Um, but they're still fixed. So you can wind up commonly in a situation where you just can't connect to what you need to talk to. Okay, so if you have IOs that are not electrically compatible. You basically, you know, you can't use the certain processes that you might want to use. And if you go read an FPGA data sheet, you'll find that there's this bewildering array of, of IO standards. Um, so they'll support, you know, 50, 60 different IO standards. And there's a lot of cleverness that goes into that. They don't actually build 60 different kinds of IOs and you only get like four of each kind because that's not going to be really useful either. What if I need like 80 of this kind and 100 of another kind? 
Um, I can't satisfy that by building a few of, of 60 different protocols. So there's actually a lot of cleverness that goes into an FPGA to how do you build IOs that are actually programmable at that fundamental level, that they are actually electrically reprogrammable um, so they can be connected to a lot of different IO standards. Uh, and there are a huge variety of IO standards. Um, some because you need speed, some because you need low power. Uh, often they're, they're made for the needs of the sensor and for you know, the memory like DRAM. DRAM chooses interfaces that make the DRAM cheap and it's the problem of the other chip to just adapt to that. Okay, so it's basically a big variety. And then often an FPGA is the hub of the system. It's got to connect a bunch of things together. So if you've got a wide variety of IO standards and then you've got like 10 different chips that each chose a random IO standards within that, um, the odds of finding a microprocessor that has all of that drops. It's certainly not zero. For the most common things, you'll still find some microprocessor that can connect to them. Uh, but for some, you're just not going to find. Them. And some of these you need to be fast too. So it's not enough to just say, well, I have one or two of those and they're slow. You need them to be fast. You need to have a lot of them. Um, So yes, this is one of the things that people don't talk as much about, but it's a big part of the secret sauce of an FPGA. So it's configurable IOs uh, and they're configurable in a lot of ways. So the voltage, the timing, whoops, uh, the protocol level, you know, so what are the signaling standards? What's the coding, et cetera? Um, and uh, when I was at Altera, actually one of the interesting things that in the FPGA industry is that these IO standards are constantly changing, right? You need to go to lower powers. You need to go to lower voltages because high voltages tend to blow up the most advanced transistors. Transistors are really small. A high voltage tends to destroy them. Um, you need to go to higher speeds. Um, sometimes there are other custom constraints, like you need to synchronize things and so on. So there, there are actually really high stakes meetings where the next generation IO standards are being hammered out. Uh, and it matters a lot because if you've been making an ASIC and you expected that the next generation wireless processing standard, we're gonna use these IO interfaces and you guessed wrong, your ASIC isn't gonna sell. You're gonna have to redo it. You're gonna be late. Um, so, so yeah, standards meetings are actually high stakes political affairs because every one of the ASIC vendors is trying to get competitive advantage. Uh, and the FPJ companies like Altera and Xilinx would also be on these standards committees because everybody knows that FPGAs are good at this. So FPGAs would be part of the solution. They'd be in the middle of the system connecting everything. Uh, and by using streaming hardware, they can connect them fast. Uh, and what was interesting that perhaps, perhaps people in the standards committee realized, or perhaps they didn't, is like the FPGA vendors kind of had a conflict of interest. Everybody else is trying to get specific standards that are going to favor their company because they're good at them. Um, and, you know, there are others probably just trying to do the right thing for the industry, but there is a lot of commercial pressure. And the FPGA vendors would tend to be like the, you know, the, uh, the mediators. Like, well, you know, there are a lot of good points raised here. So maybe what we should just do is let's just say they're all okay. Right, they're all variations on the standard, and we can all agree on that. We don't have to just pick a winner and a loser. But whenever you did that, the winner was actually the FPGA, right? So you would like to have like just a million IO standards if you could, and then the only thing that's going to be able to talk to the other chips is going to be the FPGA. Um, okay, so the other. Okay, so we've kind of been talking about processors because that's one of the things you have to consider of where do FPGA compare to that. We've talked a bit about how they compare to ASICs or custom chips. Let's talk about that a bit more. So Andrew, how are people online doing with sound? Okay, that's interesting. We didn't actually do much. So uh, we move, Andrew moved over two feet and I'm trying to avoid wandering quite as much. So, so it's, but, we now have, a, I have like now a superstitious belief that like if Andrew puts the receiver on the left side uh, of, of the camera, it's better than putting it on the right side. So we'll go with that for until proven otherwise. Okay, so we talked about ASICs kind of from a technical point of view. Let's talk about them from an economic point of view. 
Okay, so let's say you've decided I can't get the performance I need from a processor or I can't get the compatibility with IO standards I need from a processor. So I got to do something that's more um, customized. Okay, so now my options, I can use an FPGA where I reprogram it or I can make an ASIC where I actually custom manufacture it. So I've already decided I want you know, more unique hardware. But now my decision is, is which of these am I going to do? Am I going to build it or am I just going to program it? Um, okay, so what are the trade-offs of that? Like what are the pluses and minuses? If I go with FPGA, what's going to be good? What's going to be bad? Yeah, so Steven. Okay, so FPGA. Yeah, so a positive is time to bark. Okay, why? I mean, maybe it's obvious, but how's an FPGA going to get me to market faster? Yeah, so in both cases, you have to write Verilog, okay? So, or, or maybe you write high-level synthesis, which is kind of one level above Verilog, but you're going to have to be thinking about hardware. But with an ASIC, yeah, you have to do way more verification. Every time you send an ASIC, um, you, you tape out an ASIC, which means you say it's done, it's going to work, I hope. Um, and you do what's called taping out, which means custom masks are made. The price of those masks depend on how advanced your manufacturing process is. But if it's a quite an advanced mass manufacturing process, you're probably talking five, this keeps moving, but $5 million plus for a mass set. And uh, so you, you need to slow down. You need to verify a lot because you can't just say, I don't know, there was a bug, I fixed the bug, probably okay. Let's just like send it off for $5 million and see if it works. Uh, also, it takes about two months to get the masks made and get the first chip back. So there's a, every time you take a shot at, is this going to work? And I'm going to get back a prototype. There's a big time, there's a big expense. So obviously that slows you down. But the other thing it does is it just changes your whole development cycle. Uh, with an FPGA, you can be closer to software where you can just try something, put it in the system, see if it works. If it doesn't, you can try something else the next day. Uh, you're still not as fast as software, okay? Like software, you can recompile it in minutes. Whereas an FPGA is going to take a lot longer to go through the CAD system. It's going to take hours at least. So an FPGA, you still do more, more verification, more thinking about what you're doing than you would with software, but not as much as an ASIC. And that does actually make you faster, right? It's really productive to actually just say, this seems good. I thought about it some, now I'll just test. That's a really good development methodology that FPGAs make easier. Um, so yeah, it's a lot better for time to market. Obviously, the ASIC has, no matter what, the additional time to get the masks made and get the chip fabricated, but that's about two months. The actual time to market advantage of an FPGA is much, much more than that, because all that extra verification, all the extra steps slow you down a lot more than that. The other thing is the average ASIC takes two full mass sets. So every team obviously would like to get it right on the first try, but they usually don't. Okay, So you usually have to spend money on mass sets multiple times, and you have to wait multiple cycles before you have a chip that's good enough to sell. Um, okay, so there's a big advantage in time to market for all, all sorts of reasons. Uh, anything, any other positives for the FPGAs or positive states? Yeah. Yeah, so reprogrammability. So one of the things that that leads to is this faster time to market, right? Because you just buy it, you can be programming it right away, you can test faster, et cetera. The other thing it gets you is you can actually update the system after you've sent it out in the field. So uh, we used to have a video conferencing system at Altera, which we didn't build, right? Once in a while, it would basically say updating FPGA. It would literally say that. And it would basically, you could see it downloading a new firmware. So um, you can, and you can't do that uh, with an ASIC. Again, it kind of helps you with time to market. You can ship a system and you could still basically do upgrades on it with an ASIC. I guess it depends how you did it. The more hardwired the ASIC is, the less you can do that. If your ASIC actually has a whole pile of processors inside of it, then you still have the ability to do software updates. Uh, any other thoughts in terms of positives or negatives? Got to be at least one negative, right? Because if you always if you come up with all positives, then basically the other exist alternatives shouldn't exist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So is it cheaper? Is an FPGA always cheaper? 
Yeah, so it's, yeah, so smaller quantities, yes. Okay, but it's also a negative because in larger quantities, it's more expensive. Yeah, so the reason I think you're, you're, this is what you're getting at, in small quantities, you can just go buy a standard chip, right? So it depends how big the chip was. A small FPGA might cost you, like a really small one might cost you 25 cents. Uh, a moderately big one might cost you five bucks, 10 bucks, and a really big state-of-the-art one might cost you a thousand. Um, and uh, if it's like some, I, I visited one customer of Altera's once where we, our IOs could do a really high speed protocol that Xilinx could not do, okay? Which meant we had no competition. Uh, and when I visited them, the sales force would bring me in to talk about technology. I was like, not a salesperson at all. So they basically were talking about, yeah, the price is a barrier. So I asked them, well, why, well how, what is the price? Because they wouldn't tell engineering how much they sell these for. They were selling each chip for $50,000 US. And I knew the manufacturing costs. <laughs> So uh, I didn't say anything. I knew enough not to say that, but it's like $50,000. The thing's probably got a cost to about 150 bucks. Right? Um, but basically when there was no competition, they could just make up the price. Usually it wasn't quite that bad, but uh, the, the, that's cheap. I guess my point in that is that it's all over the map. If it's like a state-of-the-art chip that nobody's comparing to, like nobody has a competitor to, uh, and it's really big, then the price could still be high. But for most of them, it's not that much. And an ASIC, the first chip you get, it depends on how good your design team is. It depends on what manufacturing process you're targeting, how advanced it is. It depends on uh, uh, how complicated your chip is. But a typical number is like 50 to $100 million to get the first chip. OK, so that still makes 50,000 sound pretty cheap. But an FPGA is several times bigger than an ASIC. And we'll read some papers on how much bigger. But it's definitely not, it's not 50%. You know, the, the factors are, it's factors, right? So it depends on exactly what you're doing and what comparison you make. But the kinds of ranges you get are, you know, maybe 4x bigger, maybe 10x bigger. Uh, and that directly translates into cost. So in high volume, that means 4x, 10x, or somewhat more than 4x and 10x the cost. So if you're Intel and you're making the next generation processor, or you're NVIDIA making next generation GPU, you're going to sell an enormous quantity of these and you are for sure going to do ASIC, right? Because it's at those kinds of volumes, that's the only thing you can do. If you're a company that's going to make a hundred systems and they're pretty high end systems, then you should do an FPGA pretty much no matter what, right? Even, even if you're getting charged $50,000 a chip, which is unusual, you probably still can't make an ASIC that's less than that. And in the middle, it's gonna depend on how big the chip is, um, what is your breakpoint. Uh, does that make sense? So a question that people often come up with is though, okay, so at a certain volume, an ASIC makes more sense. So how big is that, that volume? How big is that market? Okay, so. Okay, I can't give you a very precise answer to this, right? Because it is gonna depend on a lot of factors, your process technology, the complexity of the chip, the skill of your design team. But I can give you the numbers that um, you know, we had when I was in Altera that actually came from DataQuest. We didn't just make them up. They came from surveys of ASIC manufacturers. And they change over time. So these are the numbers for 28 nanometers. 28 nanometers now wouldn't be as expensive, but you know, 10 and seven nanometers will be more expensive than this. So 20 nanometers, and this would have been now numbers like around 2015 when this was pretty state of the art. Um, so the amount to design something was about 60 to $100 million design cost. Okay. Uh, and the math, we're not most of that. So everybody thinks about mask costs, like the actual, you print out custom masks to, to make your chip. As I said, on average, you needed two of those. So at that time, you might get lucky, maybe you only need one. 
Um, you might be unlucky, you might need three or four, but that was a typical one. Okay, uh, but that's again, not most of your cost. You have to do a lot of verification. Once the chips come back, you have to do, um, you have to basically validate that they're still reliable. So there's all these extra steps that you have to do with an ASIC, uh, product engineering steps that you don't do with an FPGA. You basically just trust the FPGA manufacturer has tested the chip. They've made tons of these chips. They, they know that they're reliable and their timing specs are this, uh, et cetera. If you make your own ASIC, you do that, right? So there are all these steps that you have to do even once it comes back that you didn't do with an FPGA. Okay, so that's basically six to $100 million, so big range. Um, but that's not, that's not the size of the market, okay? So what else do we have to think about if we're deciding should we make an ASIC or not? So I guess part of it, I wanna just make back our $100 million, okay? That's not a business model. You can't say, I think I could sell $100 million of these chips, therefore I'm allowed to spend $100 million to make the chip, right? That's not a good business plan. So for a typical high-tech company that's, that's basically on the cutting edge, pretty R&D intensive, uh, their model is about on R&D. Okay, you have to have some money to actually pay your sales force, pay your accountants, uh, have your office buildings, actually pay for the chips. Like once the chip comes back, you know, this is to get your first chip back. You still have to pay your foundry for every other chip after that. Um, and you wanna make a profit, right? You don't wanna just break even. So a typical model would be 20% of your revenue can be on R&D. Okay, so now if I multiply, let's take this 100 million. That means this has to be 100 million in revenue. Now, if you've found some market where there's gonna be $500 million in semiconductors sold over the next few years, you probably aren't the only person who noticed it. So let's assume you're gonna get 20% share. Obviously you'd like to get more than that, but probably you've got competitors. Uh, that would be a pretty big market. $5 billion market. Again, this is mostly for illustration because um, you, know, you can argue with, well, these numbers can move around and which process and how big is the chip and so on. But the point is for reasonable numbers, you need to be targeting big markets. Now, if you're Intel or Intel, they're talking about Xeon processor, GPUs, the market is much bigger than this. Okay, so they are gonna be ASICs, that makes perfect sense. Um, but for a, a vast, large number of other markets, it doesn't really make sense. So even in a world, if in a world of infinite resources, that would be the most efficient uh, solution. You just can't do it. Uh, and the other thing you have to consider is that these markets usually aren't stable. Like you, your chip will be cutting edge for two, three years, depending on how fast it, the market's moving, maybe even less than that. So this can't be that over the next 20 years, you're gonna make two and a half billion dollars. Um, or usually that's not the case. There might be a few things like that, but usually you have to make this back pretty fast because you're gonna to have to make another ASIC to target that market in, in a few years. Okay, so that was you know, just how big does it have to make, does it be, how, the market have to be to make economic sense? The other thing, uh, economic uh, imperative is time to market, which, which you all mentioned. So I'm gonna put up a, I'm going to put up a made up but reasonable time to market example. Uh, just to highlight that. Okay, so y axis is revenue, x axis is time and years. Okay, so you've identified there's gonna, this is gonna be the next big thing. And sometimes you can see it coming, like 5G wireless, for example, the standards are a big money debate. What is the final standard gonna be? When that standard is set, there is gonna be an enormous amount of silicon sold. Uh, everybody knows that, right? Everybody wants to be first to it. Um, so sometimes it's not quite so obvious as that, but there are some things where you can just see them coming. Okay, so once this, 
you identify the opportunity or the standard is set and everybody identifies the opportunity, there's a certain time to market. Okay, so how long does it take you to design a system, debug it, manufacture it, get it out in reasonable volume? Okay, once you do that, so that you're making a chip, okay? So people have to design that into their system. So it has to be designed in by like Cisco and Ericsson or GM or Tesla, et cetera. So your volume doesn't go suddenly uh, um, up overnight usually. There's a period of time where people are adopting it, designing it into their system, okay? So you gotta grow market. Uh, and then after a while, either people have moved on to the next standard or the next AI algorithm or the next chip, right? You won't be the cutting edge forever. Uh, so there'll be a period of maturing market where you're facing kind of increased competition. You still got customers that you've earned, uh, but some of them are now moving to either your next generation chip or to your competitors. Okay, so you've got a maturing market. Okay, and this is where it's all made up, but a typical uh, time would be, it might take me a year after I identified what's going to happen, um, you know, what the new standard is to make my chip. A uh, year of, it's state of the art, the new standard is taking over, it's uh, gaining market share, and another year where um, people are starting to move on, right? So I sell some money, but it's gradually, I sell some product, but it's still going down. So let's say this is what I was able to do with an FPGA. Took me a year to figure everything out and debug it. And let's say I'm a really good design team and going to an ASIC only slows me down by six months, which is probably not realistic, um, but let's say that's all it takes. Okay, so I do more verification, more steps. I have to custom factors. So I go through that two month period of getting back the chips twice, still get it out in a year and a half. So that's really good. Basically, you don't start getting designed into systems until this comes back. So you actually start ramping later, but the market still starts moving on at the same time. The new standards coming out, the new process technologies coming out. So you start declining at about the same time. So I made up this example, but again, it's realistic. Uh, in this case, just by being six months late, you lost 62% of your revenue. Okay, that's six months ASIC delay. Um, so engineers almost always underestimate just how bad being late to market is because we're kind of taught to optimize. So, I mean, I have this desire to make the best thing. And if it took me another month or two, it's like, well, just let me make it better. Um, but yeah, engineers tend to underestimate this a lot. Making it better, but being later is usually worse. Okay, not always, if it just didn't work at all, that's not good. Um, and it, I lived this sometimes when I was at Altera because sometimes we would be late to market. So we had the most extreme version of this that I experienced was uh, in the Stratix 3 generation. Okay, so Altera had a very good chip called Stratix 2. And Stratix 2 was in the, I have to remember all the process technologies, uh, 90 nanometer process technology. Okay. And at that time, a new process technology came out every two years. Now it's stretched to more like three. So we knew that the new process technology is coming in two years, yet inexplicably as a company, we allowed ourselves three years to generate the next architecture, okay? Because we were coming up with clever ideas on power management and power was a big issue. So we're very proud of like how advanced our architecture was, brought in a bunch of um, clever techniques to do things like back bias transistors and so on. Xilinx took a more, they didn't come up with those techniques, but they hit market a year earlier because the new process technology existed and they had a chip ready. Um, so who do you think made the right decision given that graph? So Xilinx made the right decision and actually it was unbelievable in retrospect that we were that stupid, right? Like as a company that you go, the new manufacturing process will exist in two years, but we are basically allowing ourselves three years to create our next generation architecture. So I told you about, like I had sometimes would be brought out to visit customers and they were happy visits and sometimes sad. So at that time, our sales force looked like they had basically been in trench warfare because for a year, they were basically trying to compete with a chip that had half as many transistors and was not as fast as the competitions. That is really hard to do. The chip fundamentally costs more. 
couldn't do as much as the competition. Um, so we lost a lot of market share. And the thing is that now we came up with a chip, which was actually better than the competitions. Um, but we only have a year before the next, next manufacturing process came up and most of the customers have already made their decisions. Uh, so you don't get credit for it. So the very next process generation, uh, which was 40 nanometers, uh, the CEO of Altera basically said, I do not care what you do. Well, I didn't quite like he still wanted the chips to work, but he said, you will take risks. You'll do what it takes to be first to the 40 nanometer generation. Um, he didn't say or else. Well, he effectively did. He just left it hanging. Like this will not happen again, essentially like, or there will not be the same engineering team, <laughs> right? Like, uh, and we were first. So in that generation, we actually came out nine months ahead of Xilinx uh, and, uh, and the sales force was ecstatic. So, so anyway, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, yet we would kind of repeat that for two to three years. We'd forget that, learning, get so involved in optimization as an engineering organization that we wouldn't, we'd take too many risks, we'd take too long. Uh, and basically this discipline of you have to be there when the market exists or the manufacturing processes exists um, is, is really true, right? So uh, let's, see. okay, so that, but that obviously favors FPGAs, okay? So even if, you know, the markets were really stable and you worked out the volumes and you said it's in the end, it's going to be more efficient for me to do an ASIC. It's, it's not all even. If you get out faster with a product that isn't actually as optimized, it is almost always better. Uh, okay, so. Okay, so now I want to talk about what's inside these things. So that was kind of like the landscape of how, to, what are we talking about in chip design? What are our options? So what is an FPGA? So it's basically, it's configurable hardware. Uh, and it's basically both gates. So logic functions. Just FPGAs were only about logic functions. Now they've got lots of other functions, um, but those are called like the blocks, things that do stuff. Uh, and routing. Okay, so you have programmability in what you connect to, to what. Um, they're programmable. They're called field programmable because they're programmable after manufacture. Um, which a processor is too, but this is programmable in a different way. So at a more fundamental level, so to support spatial computing. Okay, so that's what they are in a, in a nutshell. And I think I'm gonna switch now to a few slides for the last part of the lecture. Was there a question? Yeah, yeah. So you are you from uh, Altera or Intel? Oh, okay, yeah. So uh, hard copy was okay. Hard copy was a uh, a product that existed through multiple generations of process technology at Altera. So about three generations. And what hard copy was is sometimes what customers would do is to get the market quickly, they use an FPGA to get a system out. But if, if it's a high volume system and the FPGA is big and expensive, they would then uh, take their design and try to redesign it, try to migrate it to an ASIC. Okay, so this only made sense if your volume is quite big and if the FPGA you're using is quite big, so it's quite expensive and the market is gonna take is going to be stable for long enough that, that this makes sense. Um, Altera obviously didn't like this because you'd like you make most of your money off your higher volume customers, uh, not prototyping. So people often think of FPGAs are about prototyping, and they are great for prototyping, but actually most of the money's not in prototyping. Uh, 
Um, that's part of why I mentioned that company that you know, we're charging $50,000 a chip. It's partly because we knew they're only going to buy 10 or so chips. So you're going to make half a million dollars off of them. So you're not going to cut them any kind of deal at all. Uh, you, you know, the, the prices, if you're going to buy one or two, go through the roof to try to make some money off of you. But most of it comes from the volume. So hard copy was a project to basically say, well, we'll make the ASIC for you, okay? You, and it'll be easier because you'll take your same design files that you've run through Quartus, Altera's CAD system, and you'll run them through Quartus, and we built additional um, CAD support inside Quartus to basically remap it to an ASIC. The ASIC basically rips the configurability out of the routing. So instead of using transistors to do the switching between signals, we use metal, just like a normal ASIC. And it also rips some of the configurability out of the blocks. But we could do things like keep some of the same RAM, keep some of the same multiplier. So it was easier to migrate. And because you were doing some of it from the same design files, it was easier for you as a customer. Um, it wasn't quite as cheap as you would get if you did a complete redesign of an ASIC because we ripped most of the configurability out, but we weren't necessarily ripping everything out. And also Altera and Xilinx or Intel and AMD now are high profit margin companies in their, in their FPGA division. So aside from what it costs, there's also the companies are set up that they want a lot of profit because they don't have that much competition. Um, so for all those reasons, hard copy could be quite a bit cheaper than an FPGA, but was not as if you just said, I'll do my own ASIC and go to every ASIC um, you know, uh, foundry out there and have them bid on it. Uh, what we found from that is definitely we took some high volume customers that were going to go to an ASIC and instead they went to hard copy, but ASICs are hard, right? Like the same thing that we told our customers of, yeah, ASICs, you know, lots of mistakes, lots of mass spins, lots of things can go wrong, takes longer than you think. We lived that experience because <laughs> now we were the ASIC vendor. Um, so the product, in my opinion, was never, it was never a complete success. It made uh, some money, but not nearly as much money as our FPGAs, and it took a lot of engineering resources. So Altera did about three generations of it and then, and then didn't do any more. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I'm sorry? So it's, I guess part of it is our, like our turnaround time on it was not as fast as you'd like, like the, the idea tools, we've got the same blocks, we pull the configurability out, we push the button, we'll do some stuff in the back end, it'll be low risk, it'll be fast, and it won't be quite as cheap as if you designed it, it'll be most as cheap. The reality is that lots of things would go wrong, so it actually usually took longer in time to market than you thought, and now the time to market window is closing on us. If we don't convert that customer fast, then they're just going to go to the next generation. Often the design team, the same design team that would help convert the design to a hard copy ASIC is being moved to the next generation project. Uh, so all the things, it was quite interesting because we were an FPGA company now facing all of the challenges that FPGA companies usually love. Uh, and they were real challenges. Um, so it wasn't like a complete failure. We definitely had some design wins where it made a fair amount of money, uh, but it was nowhere near as profitable as the FPGA uh, business because for those design wins, we had to devote a lot of engineering resources to getting the conversion done. In the end, I think it would have been more efficient if we had, and I guess this is what the, in the end, the CEO concluded too, if you took those same engineering resources and just doubled down on the FPGA. Uh, but yeah, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, our, our CEO for many years also came from the ASIC industry. So I think he also kind of believed there should be a way for us to capture a bigger piece of that industry too. Um, and it's not illogical, but it proved very difficult. So does that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Oh, yes, there's a fourth generation. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. And EASIC, I think, has a, oh, I guess maybe a longer conversation. They have, there are a few different varieties of like how much configurability you take out. They have, I think I have one where they only change the vias. Is that right? And another one where they change the metal. Yeah, well, that's, and that's actually what Xilinx did. So Xilinx is, uh, in the end, it actually appeared the biggest value of hard copy was that Altera could basically say, we have a migration path to a lower cost solution. If you get to that volume and the market's stable for long enough, which usually didn't happen, right? But if that happens, we have a lower risk path for you to get to a lower cost. People like that story. 
And that was actually what the CEO kept saying is even if we're not making that much money on this, we're making more money on FPGAs because of that. And he might've been right. It's hard to quantify. Xilinx's response to that is they said, well, if you are selling enough of a certain design in a certain FPGA, we will invest the engineering resources to make you a custom test pattern. Okay, so custom test pattern means we will test our FPGAs only for your design. And we will give you a lower price because they're not, they are actually failing some other tests. They, we know there are parts of the chip that don't work, but they're not the parts you're using. Um, and, and therefore they could cut their price some as well. Not as deeply because the chip's still the same size, but they could take defective chips or partially defective and sell them to somebody. We were fairly sure that in fact, what they were doing, especially if there's a high volume customer, they need to get them chips pretty fast that they would actually just ship them a lot of good chips. Um, some of them could have been defective, it's hard to say, but like they always had the option to just ship them good chips and basically sell, charge less because the profit margins in the industry are high enough you could do that. It was actually a very clever business idea from Zonix because it basically, and they would charge you some money for this. So, you know, if you're basically not going to commit to a high volume, it didn't make sense. But if you're going to get to that volume now, you pay them this, they'll make a custom test pattern. You don't really know if they did or not, but you do know you're getting the chips cheaper and you do know that they're saying you better only use them for this one project. It was actually kind of a clever way to uh, maybe sell defective chips. There's probably some of that, but also enter into a price renegotiation with certain people at certain points. Uh, so yeah, so there's lots of economic parts that go into this too. Uh, they called that easy path. It was a pretty effective counterpoint to hard copy. So anyway, any other comments on that? If hopefully this isn't, you can tell me in the chat afterwards or send me feedback if, if these digressions are kind of like, I don't know what hard copy is and that's confusing. Uh, uh, let me know whether that's a good thing to do or a bad thing. Okay, so let me go in the last few minutes of, we talked a lot about what is an FPJ good for, what is it not good for? Let's talk about what it is, which is kind of the second part of the course. So we're gonna talk about this at a high level. The reading this week that I'll post after lecture is also about that. And then we'll get into it much deeper later in the course. Okay, so FPJ basics. So they're, the oldest FPGAs were basically programmable logic and IOs. Uh, so your programmable logic could do a few gates, but it didn't do fixed, a fixed function like this. You could change what it was. And then you had programmable switches to connect prefabricated wires together. Uh, so the most basic programmable switch is a pass transistor. So you put an SRAM cell, you program a one in, you connect these two pieces of wire, you put a zero in, you don't connect them. Okay, so there are a bunch of different FPGA logic elements, the part that does that programmable logic, but the most common one is uh, a lookup table. Uh, so a lookup table, basically, well, I'm gonna show it on the next slide. It can basically do any function of its inputs. So this is a four input lookup table, any function of these four inputs I can compute. That's not gonna be enough to do sequential logic. So it's paired with a flip-flop. So I have a flip-flop, I have another MUX, and that MUX is controlled by an SRAM cell I program. So I could choose to either register or not register its output. And that would be a basic, but pretty good logic element. Okay, so FPG architecture, is basically you, you'd make a whole bunch of choices. What is my uh, logic element? Then you take that logic element and normally it's grouped into something bigger called a logic block. So you take a bunch of these you may have some shared signals. For example, the flip-flops in a logic block probably all share the same clock. Uh, you may have some local interconnect inside there. So you group a few of them, maybe 10 or 20 together in a logic block. And they don't make one of those. You make a whole bunch of logic blocks. And almost all FPGAs will arrange things in columns because it makes the layout a lot easier. I mean, you could equivalently lay it, put them in rows, but basically, um, it's a, you want to basically keep the layout as regular as you can, and you want to keep the wires going between things as straight as you can. Turns out that's a lot easier to do if you arrange things in columns. So you make a column of logic blocks. You make a whole bunch of those. Then you need IO. So in cheaper FPGAs, so the Cyclone family from Intel, uh, the Spartan and Arctic families from uh, Xilinx, you put the IOs around the outside. Uh, and then they're connected to the package using something called wire bonding. So little wires are basically melted onto these pads and the other end is melted with ultrasonics uh, onto the landing pad on the package. Uh, so you can have IOs around the outside. Higher end FPGAs usually put the IOs in columns in the middle and they're connected 
um, by flipping the chip upside down. So something called flip chip mounting. Uh, it's more expensive, but it gives you more IOs and it gives you lower inductance so your IOs can swing faster. So this would be a cheaper FPGA with what's called perimeter IO. In between these things, you put uh, programmable routing. So programmable routing is first you put down a bunch of wires, like just regular metal in both directions. Uh, and then you got to have to put programmable switches in between those. So I didn't show that there. Okay, so I talked about the logic element and I said that we usually use a lookup table. That's the most common logic element. So let's do a really small lookup table. Let's just do two inputs. Uh, so here are my inputs A and B. And the way you build that lookup table is you, you build an SRAM array uh, and a multiplexer. So basically, based on A, the state of my two inputs, this multiplexer is going to pick one of four SRAM cells. And all I do is I program into these SRAM cells the truth table of whatever function I want. So if my function that I wanted was an AND gate, I'm going to program 1110 uh, for these four SRAM locations that are accessed by these two inputs. Um, and that's the reason I can do any function of in a lookup table is because I just programmed the truth table in. So there's by definition no function I couldn't put in. Okay, so kind of showing you what is it. So the way I would program this in is I just put the truth table into the SRAM cells. Okay, so that gives me a little bit of logic. Um, we'll talk, again, talk about this later in the course. If you try to make this logic element really big, like I say, well, okay, a two input lookup table can only do a two input gate. And my chip, I might wanna do a lot of logic. So I'm gonna make a 500 input lookup table. That's incredibly inefficient. Okay, so these lookup tables are okay when they have a small number of inputs, they become incredibly inefficient with large numbers. So we can't do that. So what we have to do instead is build a whole bunch of these lookup uh, logic elements. Um, and each of them gets programmed to do some logic function. So these ones are all being programmed to do different gates. And then we connect them together with programmable routing. Uh, and we connect them to the IOs. Okay, so in, a, in an ASIC, a custom manufacturer chip, the routing is, is pretty obvious, right? You put down metal wherever you wanna connect things. Um, but that's what leads to the custom manufacturer. Well, and you put down transistors in the configuration you need to get the gates you want. But in FPGA, we, we have to do any system without remanufacturing. So we already talked about how we get different logic functions. We can't change the metal. So, uh, so what we do instead is programmable routing. And I already talked about this a bit. The simplest programmable routing switch, most fundamental one is basically a single bit of SRAM controls a pass transistor. So if I put a logic one on a pass transistor, it acts like a you know, somewhat resistive wire. It's not a perfect wire. This is where some of the, uh, a lot of the delay slowdown of an FPGA comes from. An ASIC would have used just a piece of metal. Uh, an FPGA has got a pass transistor in the middle that's significantly more resistive. It slows down signal propagation. It also takes more area. Having an SRAM cell and a pass transistor, yeah, it takes more area than just putting down a wire, so it's going to be bigger. But I get this big advantage of by programming it now, I can either connect two pieces of wire, or connect them. When you have hundreds of millions of pieces of wires and hundreds of millions of these connections, that actually gives you the ability to make a lot of different topologies. Uh, and what I'm talking about here is the most common kind of FPGA, which is called an SRAM-based FPGA. It can use a standard manufacturing process. And when you power it up, it doesn't know anything. The first thing you do is you program it. Usually there's a flash beside it on the board or PCI Express comes up and it downloads a bit stream from uh, a host CPU. And it programs all of these uh, pass transistors and all these lookup tables. And now it knows what to do. Okay, so FPGAs are gradually getting more and more complicated. So they don't just have logic and routing anymore. Uh, they have very complicated IOs. They have digital signal processing blocks, which are basically multiply accumulate units of, in all sorts of different variations. Started out as just multipliers. So you can build multipliers out of logic, but they take a lot of logic. So building them, um, building a block that just does multiplication is more efficient, but also you know, more special purpose. We don't need multiplication, it's, it's wasted. Nowadays, these are more than just multiplication. They've got all sorts of registers and accumulators and so on them. And you have RAM blocks. So you could make a little bit of RAM just out of the regular registers that you put in these logic elements, but not very much. So you build SRAM blocks, 
and connect them to the uh, programmable routing. And also they have a little bit of configurability as well. A few programming bits that, that control the timing and a few other parameters of the RAM. We'll talk about that later too. So this is a more modern FPGA now. Okay, this is a die photo of uh, Altera's, now Intel's 40 nanometer FPGA. They're not wildly different for the most recent ones, but I don't have access to the die photos. So uh, this one I had access to and put it in the keynote so that it became public. Uh, what I'm showing you here is just kind of, it gives you an idea of how much area goes into different things. So blue is the logic, okay? So Altera calls those adaptive logic modules, but those are the logic blocks. And you can see there's a lot of blue. Um, RAM blocks, this particular chip has two different kinds of RAM blocks. It has ones that have nine kilobits and ones that have 144 kilobits. So there are different columns. This white red one would be 144 kilobits. The narrow red ones would be nine kilobits. And you can see there's a lot of RAM too. So there's almost as much area devoted to RAM as to logic. Uh, and then there are, let's see, DSP blocks. In this particular chip, you can see there's a lot less area devoted to DSP blocks. Uh, and that's typical. So it's changing some. Neural networks are putting more pressure on multiply accumulate. So this area might be slowly rising, but basically you can fit a lot of multiplications in a fraction of the chip. So most of the chip is not DSP block, um, but it's also not negligible. Um, I talked about how the IOs are important. And you can kind of see that in the die size. These are the general programmable IOs. So these IOs are, there are a lot of them because people use FPGAs to connect kind of all sorts of chips together to be the hub of the system. Also, if you're doing a lot of streaming calculation on things like neural nets or wireless, you need a lot of IO to get all your data in, also to store it to off-chip DRAM. Um, so you can see they're pretty big. That's a pretty big amount of area for these IOs. And every IO in an FPGA tends to be bigger than it would be in an ASIC because it is configurable. The fact that it can handle multiple voltages, multiple protocols does come at a cost. So you get more area. Um, modern FPGAs also have lots of clocks. So they have part of, I get sometimes questions of, well, why? Like, shouldn't you put everything on one clock domain? If you could, that's a good idea. But when you're actually talking to all sorts of other chips and memories and uh, antennas and so on, you, you don't have the luxury of just saying everything's on one clock domain. So you can easily have dozens of clocks. A lot of them are small near the IOs, um, but basically you don't, generate high frequency clocks on a board anymore. You generate them with phase lock loops and delay lock loops. Uh, so there's a bunch of area to devoted to generating clocks. And again, these are highly programmable. So this is also part of what you're paying for. Uh, and then there are two types of IOs in most FPGAs nowadays. I showed you the general IOs. Those are basically more flexible, uh, but somewhat slower. They're still not really slow. They can talk to DRAM, and that's usually at multiple gigabits per second. Uh, but the really fast IOs are these serial interfaces. Um, serial interfaces basically, well, we'll talk a little bit about them more later, but they, um, they go to the highest speeds. So in this chip, they went to, uh, I, I guess you can't remember, 16 gigabits per second or 25 gigabits per second. Now it's even higher. At those speeds, you can't have as much configurability. If you put in the ability change the voltage, much ability to change the protocol, they just don't run fast enough, okay? So these IOs have to be, they still have a fair amount of configurability, but they're dedicated to these serial interfaces. Um, and basically what defines a serial interface is that the clock is embedded in the data. There's no longer a separate clock. You, re, you regenerate the clock by examining the data you're getting. Uh, and it, you can see though, they're big as well. So if you add up all the IOs, they're, they're big. Um, FPGAs benefit a lot from semiconductor scaling. All I'm showing here is from 40 nanometers to 14, all the numbers went up a lot. The logic, the RAM, the multipliers, uh, the IOs don't go up that much, okay? Because you're limited by the packaging technology, but the IOs are getting gradually faster. Uh, and, and, and basically everything is going up. But I guess that basically um, FPGAs, because they just lay things out in space, and their most efficient way to use them is spatial computing, they naturally scale very well with Moore's law. You just go to the next process generation, you naturally get twice as much of everything. Um, because of that, they tend to be very early adopters of the next generation process technology. They're also pretty regular. So foundries like them. I right, so, uh, 
until they were acquired by uh, Intel. Altera was a very loyal customer of TSMC and collaborated much more closely with their process engineers than most of their customers. TSMC really liked Altera because you have this big chip that's quite regular, uh, which is really good for working out defect uh, patterns in their next generation process. Um, so FPGAs tend to go to the next generation process very early. Uh, let's see, the last thing I was gonna talk about, but I think we're running out of time, is just how do you, well, I guess I've got a minute or two. So when you power up an SRAM-based FPGA like this, there are other kinds called flash-based where they actually don't lose their configuration, but they're not as common. The most common, because it can use standard manufacturing processes or SRAM-based. When you power up the chip, um, there's some really tricky circuitry on the FPGA called the power on reset circuit. It actually has to detect that the voltage has risen, but isn't yet at the full VDD. Um, and it basically clears everything. Because if it doesn't do that, you actually will have 100 million shorts between those different pass transistors. They all came up in random ones and zeros. You've got a power ground short through hundreds uh, or, or like millions of pass transistors, and you'll never be able to power up the chip. It'll just melt itself. Um, so that's actually a really tricky piece of circuitry to design. It was usually the scariest part when a new FPGA come back was to see if the power on reset worked, because if it didn't work, then the chip wouldn't power up and you don't learn anything else. You basically just go, okay, it doesn't power up. I guess we'll try again. Um, somebody go ask the CEO for another $5 million and you know, nobody wanted to be that person. I never worked in the power on reset. So I was happy I wasn't on that team. Um, once the text that power is going up, it clears the SRAM array and then starts reading it from flash or PCI express or something. Uh, and the way that it loads it is basically, hmm, I don't think I'm going to draw all of this. It basically loads the big SRAM. It will shift into a, into a big shift register. It's gotten slightly more complicated, but the basic idea is from some off-chip storage, some IOs are shifting in the configuration you need into a big shift register. And once it's got an, enough for an entire row uh, of the FPGA to be programmed, it basically just activates a word line and writes that row. And then it'll stream in a bunch more data to get the next... 10,000 bits or so, and it'll write that to a different row. So it basically behaves like a big SRAM. Um, it's mostly invisible to the end user. Uh, the main impact it has is the fact that, you know, for a big FPGA, it uses about 100 milliseconds after you turn the power on before it knows what to do. So sometimes that can be an issue. So there are a few FPGAs that do things differently to avoid that. Um, and basically, you're your program for an FPGA is like 100 million bits. You know, that defines all of these, uh, for a big FPGA, this defines all of these lookup table values, all of its configuration RAMs, all of these path transistor controls. And that means unlike a processor where your instruction word might be 32 or 64 bits, so you can easily change it every cycle, um, the instruction word for an FPGA is so big that you, you can't change it that often. So for most designs, it's just changed when you power up the chip uh, because it takes about hundred milliseconds to rewrite everything. Um, and we'll talk a little more about that later. There are techniques people use called partial reconfiguration where they try to change some of the programming of the FPGA while it's running. It's harder than a processor for a bunch of reasons. One of them being that it, there's just so much configuration that it takes a lot longer to change than just changing the instruction word in a, in a processor. Uh, and I think that's everything I wanted to talk about today. Are there any last questions? Yeah. Yeah, Moore's Law is slowing down. There's like lively debate about, you know, how much and so on. Let's see. Yeah, that is a good question, because I would say Moore's Law favors FPGAs in lots of ways, because uh, we'll talk about this in a few lectures, but you're bigger than an ASIC, but if you actually move to the next generation process technology sooner, that partially compensates for that. If the next generation process technology slows down, that may become more of an issue for FPGA makers. On the other hand, moving to the next generation process technology is getting more and more expensive, which actually favors FPGAs, right, because it gets harder and harder to move a custom chip. So I guess there's two different trends there. Uh, 
it used to be three years between process generations, then it sped up to two years for a long time. Now it seems to be back to three. Uh, and it's also harder to say Samsung and Intel. TSMC seems to be maintaining three years or less between process nodes. Intel has struggled in the last few years where it's gone beyond three. Um, so it's kind of hard to average between two years and say, what is the actual time? For Intel, you'd say it's more than three. For TSMC, I'm not sure that it is more than three. Uh, and Intel obviously has said, like, we're, we're shortening the cadence. I mean, that said, it definitely seems that it, it has slowed down some. There's lively debate about what does that mean? Because people have been predicting the end of Moore's law for a long time, and so far they've always been wrong. Uh, but obviously, someday they'll be right. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. Interesting question. That's kind of a vague answer, but I, I, I think the ex increasing expense of Moore's law favors uh, FPGAs, but slowing down doesn't favor them. So. Yeah. 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 So there is always a break. So basically, the NREs are higher for for ASICs, like the non-recurring engineering costs. So your first chip's going to cost you a lot more money. Um, and yeah, that number, like I said, is commonly for you know pretty advanced chips, commonly sixty to one hundred million, or even more. I know for Altera's FPGAs, we couldn't actually do a next generation FPGA for $100 million. So these numbers are widely debated because obviously the ASIC companies want to say they're lower. But you know, when we cost it out, how much is it going to do cost us to make our next generation FPGA? They're way beyond $100 million. Um, so, so that's the NRE. But then there's the cost of the chips. And the cost of the chips is you know, primarily how many good chips you get per wafer. As you go to, this is a really closely guarded secret, how much it costs for a semiconductor wafer. The cost of a semiconductor wafer used to be about $10,000. It's been slowly going up, but not that fast. And then it's about you know size of a pie plate, 12 inches. Um, the amount of chips you can get from that depends on your chip size. So if an FPGA has a chip size that is four to 10 X bigger, um, and we're gonna talk about some numbers that put it in that ballpark, I think four is probably more realistic for most systems you get one quarter of the chips. So your cost is at least four times the silicon. Your odds of a defect is also higher. So it can be more than 4X. Um, so, so you're right, at some volume, that means that even if it costs you $100 million to design that ASIC, you should do it. It also is affected though by the size of the chip. If it's a really small chip, it turns out that the um, silicon cost is actually less than the packaging cost. So it, your, your chip being four times bigger is, doesn't matter, right? Or it doesn't matter much. But if you're in a big expensive FPGA, then your, your cost is dominated by the silicon cost. So there it does matter a lot. So, so I guess there's no one answer there, um, but you're right. There's definitely this trade-off point where at some point you should bite the bullet and pay the non NRE, assuming that you're, you can handle it from a time to market perspective. If, if you go, well, I have now a, a lower cost structure for a product that will no longer sell, um, well, then that still doesn't make sense. Uh, does that make sense? I mean, solutions have been getting more programmable. So if you look at ASICs, they're also getting more programmable. Like the, if you look at, uh, you know, FPGAs are used for all sorts of processing and most of their competitors that's, that are more configurable than they used to be, right? Because you make heavier use of processor arrays and so on. Um, and again, that uh, if you can't adapt to a bunch of different standards or markets, that the chip just doesn't make any sense. That's actually a less efficient ASIC than if you just hardwired everything, but the hardwiring just often just doesn't make any sense anymore. Like it's just not really a realistic option. Um, and then it kind of muddies the water a bit more about like what is the area advantage because you had to put some amount of configurability back into your ASIC. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, thanks everybody. Uh, and I'll still be up here. So if you have a, a question, but you're too shy to ask it, uh, I, otherwise I'll see you next week. And if there are any comments about uh, audio quality or anything like that, just send them to me or post them on Piazza. <clears throat>